The idea is really to stay relevant. You really have to make sure that you're paying a lot of attention to what you're doing in your brand. And yeah, you mentioned the four P's, which is really, you know, that was developed, you know, when you think about the four P's of marketing was about product, price, promotion, and place, which really came out of a more of a CPG or a consumer packaged goods mindset. But right. when you really think about what's relevant today as we've moved more into a service economy, it's much more about these E's, which is experience, economic, engagement, and employees. Welcome, I'm Ryan Hicks, and this is Modern Business, the podcast to learn from franchise business leaders and explore new business technology. Our community is about sharing knowledge and tools that help us achieve our goals in business and beyond. Thanks for being here and welcome to Modern Business. Welcome back to Modern Business Podcast, folks. I'm Ryan Hicks. Thank you very, very much for being here. However you're listening today, maybe you're driving, maybe you're working out, maybe you're at the office, Karen, as we were just discussing that. Um, but we appreciate you being here and hope that you subscribe and follow us on all the different channels. We will link in the show notes as always. So today we have a branding and brand strategy expert on the show, Karen McSteen. Karen, welcome to Modern Business. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so you and I, we met in Austin back in October, which feels like so long ago now, but we met back in October and you were actually speaking the first time we met, you were speaking in the committee meeting and I knew that I wanted to have you on the podcast. So thank you for joining. But um, what I wanted to start off with is, could you tell the listening audience a little bit about the story of how you got involved in MITCON is what people know it today as Marketing Information Technology Conference and how the story came about to kind of shift the brand narrative for that conference. Sure. So I um, recently joined the International Franchise Association. It's just been a little over a year. And the very first meeting I went to was right after the last Frantech conference. And I was listening, I was just really there as an observer um, a year and a half ago, and I was listening to the um, kind of the post-event um, critique and evaluation and what they wanted to change for the, the following year. And what I was listening for is really what was the purpose of Frantech and how well did we deliver on it? And I didn't feel that that was actually all that clear to me. And being new to the to the committee and the conference and even to the IFA, I actually kind of said, you know, for me, I don't understand, you know, why people would come, which really opened the door to say, you know, we could probably use help better clarifying that because we, you know, internally, you know, as a committee, we're very close to it. But you're right. Maybe that is a challenge. So I offered to kind of lead that process, and that's kind of how I initially got involved in it. Beautiful. Well, I think you've, I think you, everybody's done a good job. Um, talk. Obviously, you know a thing or two about positioning and branding. Just give kind of a general uh, background of what your career journey has looked like, and uh, you know how you got into franchising. Yeah. So. My uh, background, actually, I started in the hotel business, actually working in hotels. Uh, I worked for Marriott for, in all, about 17 years. I started in operations and then moved into sales and marketing, actually, at the property level. Eventually, I uh, ended up working at Marriott headquarters, and I was uh, responsible for working on the Marriott Hotels brand, and that was during the time when Marriott was also um, kind of developing their courtyard uh, brand and they acquired mm -hmm. residence in and they developed Fairfield in. So there was a lot of brand um, kind of challenges coming our way because I was working on the core Marriott full service brand and we needed to make sure there was clarity as to what each of these uh, brands stood for within the portfolio and how to kind of think about them moving forward, how to ensure that each of these brands stayed relevant. So that's kind of where I got my brand start and it was really, you know, kind of the service industry focused on branding. And I was, uh, I stayed there, um, like I said, for about 17 years. And then I actually left the hotel industry and went to um, work at AOL during the AOL Time Warner merger timeframe. Again, a brand that was meshing with a lot of other brands. So there was a lot of 
um, there was a lot of brand, you know, discussions and challenges that needed to be addressed. And I, by looking at working in a completely different industry is what kind of gave me the interest in, in maybe starting my own practice. So 16 years ago, I actually started my own brand strategy consulting firm and working with all kinds of businesses. Um, a lot of my clients are still in kind of either the hospitality or hospitality related businesses, um, mm-hmm. but I have also worked in technology and education and, and other markets as well. Yeah, and we were, I think it was a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago, we were talking about some of your background and AOL and how the brand was really America Online. And you gave an analogy, I forgot what the exact pretext of the of the conversation was, but um, from a brand strategy and a brand positioning aspect, I've seen, I've read a few articles that you've written online that you've written in franchise world magazine and some different places. And in one of them, you talked about, you know, traditionally when you're looking at marketing, it's, it's the product price promotion place. It's the four P's, but you wrote an article that talked about the four E's and I wanted to just have you talk a little bit about what those four E's are um, for the listening audience as folks, whether they're emerging brands or established brands that need to reemerge. Um, the four E's I thought were really powerful. So could you share a little bit about that? Sure. So the idea is really to stay relevant. You really have to make sure that you're paying a lot of attention to what you're doing in your brand. And yeah, you mentioned the four P's, which is really, you know, that was developed, you know, when you think about the four P's of marketing was about product, price, promotion, and place, which really came out of a more of a CPG or consumer packaged goods mindset. But when you really think about what's relevant today as we've moved more into a service economy, Mm -hmm. it's much more about these E's, which is experience, economics, engagement and employees so like when you think about experience i mean when, particularly it, it's really about the synthesis of the product that you're offering and the services that you offer and experience becomes much more about kind of the multi-sensory um, immersive kind of emotional elements of um, what people get from your brand it's not just about buying a product and, and pulling it off of a shelf but it's you know think about like when you go to starbucks you're in there for the store experience as much as you are for the coffee. And so it's kind of the integration of this product and service element. That's really what experience is about, you know, and economics is about, you know, what is really the value that you're offering, not about the lowest price, but about kind of the value as a whole, rather than just, you know, thinking about pricing the product. What's, what are you pricing in terms of the total experience that people are getting? And how do they feel about that experience? And if you can connect that experience and, and price together, the economic model changes significantly because people will pay more when they're getting a full experience. Back to Starbucks, you're paying a lot more than just for a cup of coffee. You could get a cheaper cup of coffee somewhere, but you're getting an experience instead and you're willing to pay for it. The 30 being engagement is about you can't just promote the brand with discounts and coupons and expect people to engage. It's really about the business of engaging and and really understanding what customer needs are all about and delivering them so much value that they get in the habit of coming back again and again because they're part of the experience. They're innovating with you. They're providing you constant feedback and they feel like their voice is important. And then lastly, the fourth view is really about employees, which is a dimension, if you think about the four keys that was completely missing, but your employees are your brand. They're the ones in the service industry in particular that are actually delivering your brand promise, and they have to be expert in what they do, and they have to be able to relate well to your customers and be responsive and resourceful on on a dime. You know, it's one of the things we believed in the hotel business more than anything was that uh, your employees, when they are delivering the experience, every experience is different because it's being developed as you go, because every interaction with a customer is very, very different. So they need to be very resourceful in thinking about how they are going to be delivering your brand promise. Um, you know, another example, a great example is Southwest Airlines about that. They hire people, uh, they say, with a warrior spirit, a servant's heart, and a fun-loving attitude. And that's really about how they think about their brand. And there's nothing better, nothing better in terms of how you deliver your brand than making sure you think about how your employees deliver it. I could not agree more. If you think about it, 
especially in a commodi- commoditized world, there you know there there are countless options in most sectors for us as consumers to go choose who we want to do business with. And the groups and the brands that stand out are the ones that get it right at the front line. And that boils down to employees, if you think about it. So some of the businesses that I consult with and work with, they have issues, for example, with recruitment or even even extrapolating it out to like a food service brand that is trying to impact profitability at the bottom line. You would not think that employees are, you know, are, you could drive profitability by focusing on hiring process and employees. But whenever you're, I like to say hiring for the enthusiasm and and you're hiring around the values that directly translates into the fact that you do not have to sit in this cycle of rehiring and this and that. And then when, when your employees have the right, um, they're, they're, they're delivering basically on the brand promise, your brand lives through your employees at the front line. So I could not agree more um, are there any examples from the whether it's experience standpoint? I know that we talked about Starbucks, but are there any examples? Um, and then you also mentioned Southwest Airlines with the employees on the front lines. Do you have any other examples for ways either you've helped clients kind of drill that experience and 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 look at all of this, or maybe outside ways from examples from? Uh, brands that other people might be aware of. Do you have any more top of mind examples? Well, you know, when you talk about like the examples are really about how people experience the brand, right? So yeah. when we work with our with our clients, one of the things is is you have to first be very very clear on your positioning. If you don't really actually understand who you are, and mm-hmm. a lot of brands don't then delivering on their positioning in terms of the actual experience and how you pay off the brand is very, very difficult. So understanding kind of what that customer journey feels like from beginning to end is really a critical aspect of bringing a brand to life. So when you then take, you know, what examples are of brands that do that really, really well, um, another brand that's, that's phenomenally good at that, knowing who they are, knowing what they stand for and knowing how they bring it to life with their, and knowing, under, and understanding their customers really, really well is like USAA. Mm-hmm. Fabulous example because they really truly understand who their customers are and what it is that they deliver for them. And they deliver it in a really, really meaningful way. And they think about every part of the customer journey and they train their employees to make sure that not only do they understand what their customers are going through, but they make them completely empathetic. Like they have their employees as part of their orientation go through a boot camp yes. where they actually have to walk around with a heavy backpack and they have to eat the um, ready meals and they have to do everything that their customers are experiencing. Read letter. They also read letters from people that have been sent home back back home to family so they can understand the emotion that's tied to what it's like to be away and to be deployed. Puts them really like literally puts them in the shoes of their customers. And that's how employees really, really learn what goes on in their customers lives and what part of the journey they are. They're playing then. Love it. I think this is a good time. Could you share a little bit about your company and some of the strategy work that that you guys do, uh, because I think that uh, that piggybacks really well into what you're an expert in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, you know, the services that we offer, uh, first and foremost, is positioning. I mean, that's really the core when you talk about being a brand strategist. It's understanding the positioning that sets your brand apart from customers. So that's kind of the core service we offer. We do that by our second service is really by gaining unique customer insights. So we do market research both on the qualitative and quantitative side. We then, once the brand strategy is developed, we help our clients develop a memorable brand name. Sometimes people need help with naming. Sometimes they don't. They may already have a name, but also making sure the identity and the messaging within, once you have the name and the core insight about your positioning, kind of what is the identity that brings it to life and what are the messages that bring it to life. Um, and then we develop the help develop brand culture elements so people know kind of what they, what kind of is, are the values that are the glue that really bring the positioning and, and the meaning yes. to the experience and then de- defining the customer experience, kind of the customer journey from beginning to end. 
those are the elements that we are the services we offer within our business. We also do, you know, you'd mentioned that, you know, you, the first time you saw me, I was speaking, we do do quite a bit of speaking and workshops to yes. help customers, you know, and, and potential organizations think about how they can do the positioning work, how, what that means and making sure that their employees are educated on the importance of brand. Love um, it. Some, you had, you had asked about some of the projects that we've worked on. We have done work, um, a lot in the hospitality industry and, and in the related industry in, uh, of hospitality. So we've done work like with Ritz Carlton um, and helping them really think about even communicating their brand um, internally and amongst their the owners of the hotel. So, you know, t- all these different constituents beyond just the consumer, but also how do you also communicate to owners, to management, yes. to inside and outside the company? Yeah, I think a lot of folks listening um, can certainly feel that, uh, especially some of the the emerging brands kind of getting a grip on how to, sometimes it feels like herding cattle, but just positioning within your internal ecosystem is a really critical thing. And like you said, I, like I love how you talked about creating the brand strategy and then creating culture around it and how the values are really the glue that, that, that bring the two together. It's so, so true. Um, yeah. One of the one of the other articles that I have read of yours talks about trusting your customer. So what does that mean and why is it important to trust your customer and how would a brand go about looking at that? Yeah, well, you know, when you think about, if you talk about brand as a promise and helping people and brands understand what promise they're making to their customer, trust is at the foundation of any promise. And for any long-term relationship, when you think about your your personal relationships, you have to have trust. And when customers trust a brand, they become much more engaged and much more deeply connected to that brand. But you can't just say trust is one of our values. You actually have to earn trust. Mm-hmm. And customers know very clearly when you don't trust them. Businesses Um, unfortunately send a lot of messages every day about how they um, don't trust their customers. And, you know, when you think about, well, (laughs) um, since I know a lot about the hotel business, here's an example. If you've ever seen those little hangers that have kind of those little tiny hooks on a bar that doesn't work if you were to take those hangers home. That's why they do that because they are sending a message. We don't trust that you're not going to steal these hangers. So <laughs> we're going to make them so they don't work well for you, right? And that uh, that is a really, you know, these are subliminal messages. They're not obvious messages, but if you play that out through every part of an experience and everywhere you go, if people are basically sending the message, we don't trust you. This is how much it costs if you steal yes. this, or this is how much. So you start to send these signals that, you know, we just don't trust you. Well, if, if you're paying a lot for that room and somebody takes a hanger. I mean, I'm not sure that's the end of the world because you would rather set, there's only a few people that would ever take advantage of that. And by <laughs> thinking of your customers the other way and saying, we're going to, we're going to actually lean towards that. Most people are good and with their, and, and will do the right thing and not set up your hotel or your business for people that um, are going to be doing the bad thing and doing the wrong thing. It's really set up for people that are doing the right thing, knowing that there's going to be a handful of people that are going to take advantage, but don't send the message to everybody that you're going to take advantage. You know, the same thing happens. There are some quick service restaurants that um, sometimes will give you one or two napkins when you get your order. Mm-hmm. rather than leaving napkins out for people to take because there's this, you know, people are going to take a whole, you know, um, handful of uh, napkins and that's going to be waste. And yes, that costs money. But on the other hand, if it, if I have to go back up to the counter and wait and maybe interrupt another customer who's ordering in order to get a napkin, a second napkin, because we had a spill or because I have messy kids or I'm messy myself, that's interrupting somebody else's experience as well as mine. And at least two of us then with a bad taste in our mouths about why can't you just let me take as many napkins as I need because I'm a slob, right? Just send that message. But there's things that people can do about that. You know, I mean, certainly if you first embrace the belief that most people are good and, and are willing to do the right thing, you can then think about generosity instead of distrust when you're yeah. developing your, your processes. 
The second is, is you could actually do an audit of your customer experience today and look at where these places are that you don't realize you've built into your business model that you might be sending messages of distrust. I don't think companies actually do this on purpose to think that they don't trust their customers. It, it's, it's certainly, you know, cost management, et cetera, which is completely understandable. But if you just kind of step back from a customer perspective and say, what kind of message does this send? You might find places if you did an actual trust audit to say this actually could could hurt our, our promise. And That's then important. third, make sure you go look at your, sorry, that you go look at your, your processes and, and change those processes once they beca- you become aware of them. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to add okay. that, just validate this. Like, it's critical because if you look at, for example, store manager, store managers incentivized to focus on, you know, revenue targets and keeping costs down and this and that. And at the, you know, at the local level in Nashville, Tennessee, they might not be thinking about, well, what's the impact uh, of, of us putting out two napkins on the brand? It's like, they're probably countless, just little things like that. And another thing that I thought of whenever you're speaking on that is, we had uh, we actually had Kevin Roberts on the podcast. He, I hope I'm not butchering his name, but I don't know him like very well personally. But he is the guy from Saatchi and Saatchi, and he's he wrote he's written a few books. Uh, my favorite book of his is called Sixty Four Shots. But in that book, and then I think in another one that preceded it, he talked about moving from brand mark to love mark, and and what a love mark really is is it's that. It's, it's really about the relationship. It's about the trust. And what you're talking about is really just tactical ways that, that, you know, emerging brands that are focused on growth and, and putting out fires and doing all these different things, you probably don't stop and think about that. So I love it. I think it's critical and uh, I enjoyed reading that article and I enjoyed chatting about that here again now. Now, it's, it is critical, particularly getting back, you know, you're asking about the four E's. If you think about the experience, and that's the reason we encourage this trust audit, is how does the experience feel from your customer's point of view, right? And if you can be objective about it, which is hard because you know your business so well, but if you could be really objective about it and walk through that experience and say, huh, didn't really think about that. Maybe we should offer, you know, more napkins or maybe we should offer to not have, you know, these hangers put this way. It just puts it in a different light when you kind of go through it with that mindset. Yeah. And as, as uh, operators, you know, your business so well, that could be a hindrance and a blinder. That's why you might want to work with some folks like yourself. Um, the next topic, and then I'll be respectful of your time and we can wrap it up. Um, but the, the really the last topic that I wanted to touch on is something that I am very keen on, and that is personal branding and building personal brand. After you and I met, you actually sent me a booklet. I think it was actually we, we spoke on the phone and you sent me a booklet. And thank you very much for that. It was really awesome. Um, but in this booklet, you talk, it, it kind of walks through some exercises on how to think about going about establishing and creating your own personal brand. And what I wanted to just have you speak to is in a 2018, 2019 and beyond world, how important is it for folks to focus on and also think about their own personal brand in conjunction with their, their business brand? But think, how, how do you think, look at personal branding as a strategic way um, to build trust and to do all the things that you want to do as a business owner and get your message out there. How important do you think that is? Well, I think it's critical because the knowing what you stand for, this is just no different than a business being clear about what they stand for. Individuals have the same challenge, right? What do you stand for and how do you put yourself out to the world? And if you really understand your true purpose and really understand kind of what it is that you want to be in this world, Mm. it makes you not only stand out as an individual that is looking to either put a business out there or if you're, you know, starting in your career or if you're established in your career, what do you want to be known for? What conversations do you want to leave people with? And how do you execute on that every day? And it's something that I, I actually became very passionate about because I learned so much, you know, about how people took what I was talking about as it related to 
their business brands or their corporate brands and started asking, how can I apply this to myself? And so taking the exact same principles we use for develop, for helping to develop a brand for a company mm-hmm. and turning it for themselves. And I've had people come back to me and say, I got promoted as a result of what you helped me think about. Or I was a person who, people who um, are individual consultants or have businesses they are just starting, they tell me about deals they were able to get because they actually were more authentic than they had ever thought about being because it helped them understand more about themselves and really how to put themselves out to the world. I love it. So I'm in my little world over here. I'm thinking about, uh, we have a lot of franchisors in our audience. We have multi-unit operators. We have suppliers. We have folks across the spectrum. But I'm over here thinking about as like the entrepreneur, but even even as employees, even as uh, entrepreneurs or managers or whatever it is, it like you you reference the getting the promotion it can never hurt to know thyself and to know what you stand for and to develop that and uh i i just think that there's a tremendous opportunity like even from a goal setting perspective like think about an organization i actually just recently recorded a podcast i haven't put it out yet but i'm posting this but if you think about an organization you have your mission your vision your values your brand strategy your positioning your brand promise how many people understand their personal purpose, their personal mission, and actually go in a balanced manner, look at the different areas of your life, even beyond career, how do, you, how do they go look at um, setting goals around those? And whenever you're rising the tides in one area, you're growing in all areas. And so and I just think it's super interesting. And I think it's a big opportunity for people listening. I think it's a big opportunity for folks all around, especially in today's connected world, when you've got the ability to publish content, to tell the world, that like give the world a glimpse into your life, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. And I think having clarity about what problem that you yourself can uniquely help your customer, your target customer, even if, as you're talking about a personal brand, everybody has somebody they're targeting, be it their yes. boss or wanting to get promoted or to sell more franchises or whatever, what problem can you help them uniquely solve? And that's where you stand out in the world. If you could be really, really clear about what you have that no one else has to offer. That's what brand is all about. Love it. I'm jotting down a quick note. Something you said made me, <laughs> made me write a note. Um, <laughs> how do people get in contact with you? If, if that you have this really neat booklet where you, can say, you sent me a booklet from a personal brand perspective, and I'm sure you have other resources. How do people get in contact with you for that and or for, for um, branding and brand strategy help? Oh, my website is brandmatters.com. Um, and right there, there's a contact us, but my email is kmixteen at brandmatters.com. It's got all my contact information, and I would be delighted to um, send that booklet to anybody that might be interested. Perfect. Well, Karen, thank you very much for joining us today and you're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Cheers. Cheers.